Hi everyone, I'm Mayma Carmel, your host for Breathe TV. Today we're talking about a really special episode, an issue, which is what women who are younger are going through breast cancer and their breast cancer journey. I learned to have breast cancer at 32 years old and it was really, really traumatic having that diagnosis at a young age and knowing what to do and figuring out how to navigate life, being a young woman, being a single parent, and getting through breast cancer, making choices that would change my life, and thinking about my long-term journey. Today we have two women with us who are really amazing young women, Brittany Gregory and Mesa Clay, both women who are young and going through the breast cancer experience. We're happy you're here today, guys. Brittany, you learned that you had breast cancer at 21, right? Yes. Yeah, and we met at that time, your mom was like, I'm gonna get my girl some support. I know your story because I, you're close to my heart. I've known you for a long time. But share with the viewers, you know, how you found out that you had breast cancer. What was that like and that experience of navigating at 21 years old? Hi, I am Brittany Gregory. And like Mamo said, I was diagnosed at 21. I was actually during my a uh, senior year of college when I found out. I was in the shower one day and uh, on my left breast found something that I feel like shouldn't be there and didn't think much of it, but knowing myself and knowing who I am, I was like, I'm just gonna go to my pediatrician because I still went to my pediatrician at the time. No one thought anything of it just because of my age and of course how young I was. And then found out after getting a biopsy that it was stage two invasive carcinoma. What made you do your breast exam in the shower? What made you go and get that mammogram or other testing? Because you wouldn't think about that normally at your age to even do either breast exam or additional screening, right? I don't know. I guess it was a sign that I needed to check it, and I did. But at that time, of course, in my mind, I didn't think anything of it. And I know my body. And so I was just, I feel like I needed to kind of calm my mind to make sure nothing was wrong. But in reality, something actually was wrong. So I, I'm glad of my self-awareness that I checked and kind of took those steps to make sure. So luckily, I found it at an early stage. And so I I'm not sure what the road would have been if I didn't check myself. So I'm, I'm grateful that I am aware of my body. Yeah, so that's a big lesson for women who are younger, who are watching this episode the importance of knowing your body. You're never too young to be your best advocate. To know your body and like Brittany to follow your instincts. You know, she was taking a shower, felt the lump in her breast and knew it wasn't normal and pursued additional testing. And so just keep that in mind, you guys, you know, getting breast cancer early can be life-saving. So really Brittany, your kudos to you for being your, your best advocate. We always talk about, you know, women going through breast cancer, but not about what, what it feels like. I remember you and I talking about you being a young adult and not being able to enjoy your experience being in college because you had cancer. So can you share what it was like to have cancer in that last year of college? Your friends are having a good time, they're partying, they're living it up, and you're dealing with cancer and no hair, and no eyebrows and other things. I went to East Carolina University and it was really big with football and there was a football game and it was the day after I got my first chemo and I was on the couch and you could hear people like yelling and screaming and like having a good time. And then there was me sitting on the couch. I couldn't move. It was my first treatment. And I was like, what is this? In that time, I was like, this is not fair. But then going through it and seeing the growth that I have progressed and made it out on top. And I honestly feel like what happened to me made me the person that I am today. And so it's, it's hard and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it that it's easy, but I feel like throughout this process, my mindset, I had to be positive. It was kind of like a fight or flight instinct. And I was like, I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna make it through. And it's, it's actually kind of crazy because May 17th of 2017, I was diagnosed and now it's about four years later and I'm on top and I'm healthy and I'm happy. And so it's, it's, a, it's a process and I'm, I'm glad that I'm able, I'm grateful and I'm, I'm lucky that I made it out on top. Seeing you right now makes me feel very emotional. I'm so proud of you. And I really want the guests who are watching to think about, you know, there are women that you may see walking around, you know, in, in the grocery store, you know, in the mall or on the street and thinking she looks like somebody who's just a happy-go-lucky young woman, not knowing that she could be living with breast cancer and what she's going through. 
And, and it is hard because people don't see you sometimes. If, if your hair, if you have a wig on or whatever, they don't know you're going through cancer. And they may think, why is she being antisocial? Or why isn't she hanging out? Or, you know, just because you, you don't know what you're dealing with. And even if they do you know, sometimes you're left out of things because people are living their life despite you having breast cancer. So I want people who are watching, who are, who are where you were, to learn from that experience of what you went through. Talk about what that was like, the fertility, thinking about that and potential like having a boyfriend and what did it feel like? My mental health at the time wasn't, wasn't the greatest. I also had struggles with comparing myself to people. So when I was actually sick, it kind of hit me that, you know, I, I had a double mastectomy. So on top of being bald, I didn't have myself on who I was. And so it was hard. It, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to start. And of course I met you and it kind of blossomed me wanting to advocate for other women who are under the age of 40 or even above the age of 40 and knowing that you can get through it and you are put on this earth to live your life to the fullest potential. And that is what I'm trying to do now. And I'm, I'm so grateful that I'm able to, to tell my story and keep telling my story even four years later, because at the time you don't really think about it. And then as each year goes on, you think and you're able to actually process what happened to you. And it can be a lot. And I mean, even right now, like, I still think about it every day. It's, it's a part of me. I still have to go to doctor's appointments. I still have to get checkups. I still have to make sure that I'm healthy and I'm okay. And so it can be a lot, but as each year kind of goes forward, you can kind of look back at the person that you have become from such a traumatic experience at a young age. Thank you, Brittany. So Mesa, tell us about your story and your breast cancer experience. Hi everyone, my name is Mesa Clay. I did not have breast cancer. I don't have cancer now, but I am a BRCA1 mutation carrier. My mom actually experienced breast cancer at a pretty young age, she was 33 when she was diagnosed and she took it upon herself to get prompted to get genetic testing. She didn't understand why she had breast cancer when no one else in her family had breast cancer. And it turned out that she was a BRCA1 carrier, which meant my, um, myself potentially could be a carrier as well. So at 23, I was a little bit forced, but not quite so forced by my mom to go ahead and get genetic testing to make sure that either I did or did not carry the same gene as herself. And when I was getting tested, the genetic counselor that I have prompted me to understand that people of African-American descent typically don't carry this gene. It's just not, just not in their nature to have it. And so she told me I didn't need to be genetic tested. The person at the s testing center told you that people who are of color, black people don't typically get the BRCA mutation? Yes. She told me they typically don't have this gene. There's no point in testing it. If you want to go home, you can. <laughs> Black women tend to have the highest breast cancer mortality rates because of these kind of things. And women who are younger tend to have more aggressive breast cancers and, and higher death rates for these kind of reasons. Like that is like totally freaking like mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. I had a doctor tell me not to worry about it. And had I listened to her, I would have never found out that I had the gene and I could have gotten breast cancer younger than my mom or, you know, the next day, you know, in my thirties, because, you know, when you have BRCA1, your chance of getting breast cancer is 85 to 90% before the age, I believe of 35. And my mom fell into that category easily. She was 33. So watching her go through it prompted me to realize that that could either be my fate or I could take the steps to get my bilateral double mastectomy early, um, which I did the following year. So last year in the middle of COVID, I went ahead and got my bilateral double mastectomy as a preventative measure to keep myself from getting cancer because I had a doctor tell me, you don't have to worry about it. And I actually did. <laughs> That's insane. I mean, a, a lot of the work we talk about at Tiger Lily is about, you know, how to self-advocate, which you guys had amazing mothers, both of you, your moms, were helped to ensure that you had that in your blood, right? To self-advocate. But, you know, to have a medical provider tell you when you're asking for a test that you don't need the test to come back or don't just don't get it. When you're in a population that does have more aggressive breast cancers and that higher rate of mortality, that's so insane to me. Like, I'm just so glad you guys had the wherewithal to know and to act and to pursue treatment because women oftentimes don't know their family history 
They don't know how to self-advocate. They don't know when they're told by a doctor to come back in six months or a year or forget about it to go back or fire their doctor. And so what you did was extraordinarily strong and, and boss lady, and that's amazing. And so thank you for doing that for yourself. So Brittany had breast cancer and you are a previvor, which is, you know, similar experiences, right? You're, you're a young woman living your best life. Now you have to think about this disease at a young age. Being a previvor at a young age, what were things that you felt were a barrier for you? Prior to getting my surgery, I've acted, I've modeled, I've, I've always been a very like forefront sort of person. I just kind of collapsed in a shell because I, I didn't feel like myself. It took a while before I could get to feeling like myself again, having confidence again, because I had confidence before, which was an incredible foundation because I already had it and to lose it because you don't, you're trying to find yourself again. That was, that was easily the most difficult part. Most women wouldn't have a mother talking to them about breast health or a mutation to be aware of it in the first place. Most women your age would not be maybe following through to, you know, with any concerns about having had that mutation, like what's next? Most women, mean if they go to a doctor and the doctor says, you know, don't take this test, don't worry about it, would have said, okay, I trust you, I'm gonna go home. So those things, those things are huge barriers to education, to getting the right care, and to prevention, because you have a mutation that can alter your life that your mother had. And so, you know, to me, the provider, in a sense, was the biggest barrier in your instance, in your situation. Thank God you spoke up for yourself and you did have the testing and then the surgery. Brittany, what do you think, what are things that you wish you had known sooner to be able to act on? Uh, it's crazy that we talk about doctors because I feel like if I didn't have the relationship with my pediatrician, I don't think it would have gone any further than it did. Because even in herself, when we had a close relationship, she didn't think anything of it, but she was the one that was like, we'll go get an x-ray and we'll see if anything is wrong. And then from there, that's when I had my biopsy. So if it just stopped there, then I would have no idea what was actually happening to me. And at that point, it wouldn't have just been stage two. It would, I mean, it could have went all the way to stage four. I have no idea. And so it, it's crazy to think that you trust these professionals to quote unquote, help you and make sure that there's nothing wrong with you. But if you were under a certain age, it's like, you don't have that respect, but like, I know that there was something wrong. And so that's where that kind of like inner self kind of came out because knowing my body and myself, even at a young age, I'm able to advocate and speak up and not even just for myself, but knowing that if there's another woman that is feeling like there's something wrong with their body, I even say now to my friends, to family, to go check it out. It could be nothing, but at the same time, it could be something. So just, just be aware of who you are and what's going. If there's a change, like even a subtle change, like just go check it out. Just make sure that you are doing what you need to do for your body and for yourself. Nothing's worse than waiting six months to a year and realizing like it's stage four, right? And it's never your fault. No one tells you how to navigate cancer or look for a disease, right? You're not taught in school. Okay, here's biology class, here's chemistry class, here's how to look for a disease at 21. You don't, you're never taught that, but it's important to know that you are your own best advocate. You know your body better than anybody else and always, always pursue what you think is right until your gut tells you it's okay. All doctors are not bad. There's some great doctors like mine, doctors, awesome but i had to fire two before i got to the right one because the first two were just not they were not good doctors <laughs> until i got to the one who like trusted me and supported me when i began talking like i was young right not as young as you were but i was young and going to things like you know conferences and and i was on panels talking about my story and i kept saying the doctors are oftentimes wrong and someone said to me after i spoke one time don't ever say that you can't educate a doctor they're never wrong and I said, a doctor misdiagnosed me and told me to come back when I was 40. I'm, I was 31 years old. She was wrong, right? And so I said, why don't we do, a, do some kind of campaign to educate doctors? And they were like, we, we don't do that. How are you gonna educate a doctor? And I'm like, cause they don't know everything and they have to evolve. Our bodies are changing and, and times are changing and I'm getting people that I, like yourselves and I'm meeting who are in their 20s going through breast cancer. That brings me to the next question which talks about you know, how can you advocate for yourself within your treatment plan? Because when you're diagnosed, you know, you get all these words spouted at you about, you know, the estrogen and triple negative and positive and negative and 
Alliston scores and Braca, you're like, what in the, is there a glossary for this stuff? Cause you don't know what they're talking about. So how do you even know what to pick, you know, for testing or for, you know, your, your treatment plan or whatever, when you just don't even know about cancer, how did you guys navigate that? I'll go with you first, Brittany. I actually got a second opinion. The first opinion, I, even my family and I didn't feel confident enough no like disrespect to this doctor, but he was used to dealing with women who were over the age of 40. And so at that point, I actually, one of my good friends had, was a doctor at Wake Forest. And I was like, I think we need a second opinion. And so we actually got a second opinion and I felt so much more confident in these doctors that they would be able to help me. And from there, they actually kind of took it step by step with me because my parents found out first before me, I was actually at summer school and they found out and they had this list of paper and it was like everything that I needed to do to make sure that I was going to be okay. And at that point, I'm like, I'm in summer school. I'm like, I'm, I'm, go I'm in college. I don't know what this is. And it was just very overwhelming. And, and I, I wish that in a way that it's not like, oh, you have cancer. It's like, let me describe this to you. Let me break it down for a second. Cause at that point, you know, people who have experienced, you know, people who have it, but you yourself have never experienced it. And so getting a second opinion for me was the best thing because they of course didn't know anybody at my age that's had it, but they were able to work with me and talk with me and kind of break down everything that I needed to do. Cause at that point at 21, you're like, what? <laughs> I don't know what this is. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I was lucky enough to have doctors that heard me and was able to at least kind of break things down for me, for me to understand what was going on. Cause you're right. They throw all of this information and you don't know what's going on. And so you kind of also have to process it mentally and, and talk about it even with your family. Cause at that point, my family didn't know what was going on either. So we were all kind of like, what, what is happening? And you know, the traumatic experience in itself kind of hits in. So it, it was, it's definitely a process to say the least. It is a process. Cause you know, like the shock is one thing, then trauma is the next thing. Then they call it health literacy, but it, health literacy has to do with both shock and trauma. You can't process when your brain shuts down. And then you're also being, have been told by the world for how many years that people get breast cancer at 40. You're like, well, no, this is not true. So you're, you just kind of totally don't understand. But, you know, to your point, you, you had a family that embraced you and supported you. And, and also, you know, you advocated for yourself by seeing another doctor. Because it's really about who you trust, who trusts you. And, you know, I, someone told me one time, the doctor you pick, you have to look them in the eye and eyeball to eyeball, know they're going to they're gonna fight for your life. They're going to fight for your life like it's their own daughter, their own child. And don't stop till you find that person that will look you in the eye and lean into you and hold your hand and say, I got you. And what about you, Misa? You had to say, no, I want this test. What did that feel like having to tell a doctor or a nurse or whoever the person was like, no, you're wrong. I want to get this done. What was that interaction like for you? I, I'll be honest. I actually did realize how powerful that moment was in the moment because she was just, you know, a sweet older lady. And she was, I think in her mind, she was just trying to like save me some time when unfortunately I was already there. She would have stolen your time away though. Exactly. In her mind, saving you time was gonna be stealing your life if you hadn't pushed for that test. I know for a fact, if I had left that office without getting tested, my mom would have killed me. And at the time, I, I, I don't know, I just wasn't, it wasn't as powerful of a moment in the moment and so after the fact, and I thought about it and I was like, wow, she like has a PhD and she told me like, I'm not, this is like what she does on a regular basis, you know? And she told me that I, I simply don't need it. And of course I just, I, I just told her like, no, my, you know, my mom had BRCA1, I, I have to be here. I have to get this test. And prior to even getting the test, if you've ever had genetic testing done, you have to get your blood drawn and I am deathly afraid of needles but deep down I, I knew I had to I just had to do it whether it was positive or negative I just had to go ahead and get it done once it came back positive and she was completely incorrect I completely left that entire string of doctors and I went with the same doctors that my mom had when she had cancer luckily enough you know we still live in the same city they all still work um, in the same connection so I was very very fortunate enough to be gifted doctors that 
were very accommodating. There's a ton of needles involved and I, I absolutely panicked. They took extremely good care of me, not because they knew who my mother was, but because I, I was a patient myself and to have to go through what we have to go through so young is, uh, is already very traumatizing. So I just, I just had an incredible team of doctors. I was very, very fortunate to have my mom's, my mom's doctors. Yeah, so you both were advocates. You were advocate for your the right, getting the right testing and then procedure, and you, Brittany, with the, you know your healthcare provider. I know for me, when the doctor came in the office, my oncologist, and put a paper on the table and started scribbling circles, and I'm like, what are you doing? And then she's like, well, this is this is that, AC, da-da-da-da-da, and, and Taxol, da, da And I was like, what are you talking about? So I kept that paper for almost like five years because it took me that long to understand what the hell she was talking about in the first place. And I know she's, an, she's a great doctor. I still, we still talk here and there, but I feel like I wasn't given a choice. I feel like they just told me you're going to have this and you're having that. You're going to have that next and then that next and you're done. And so I really encourage women to be active in their breast cancer treatment journey. Do you feel that you were active in you picking what you thought was best for you or no, Brittany? I feel like I was active in it. At first, they said that I could have a lumpectomy in my left breast where they found it, but I had small breasts at the time. And so it would honestly look really weird if I just got that down here. And then they were like, well, then you could just do one on one side. And I was like, that still wouldn't look right. And so at that point, I was like, honestly, let's just do both because it's going to reduce my risk anyway. And so I kind of with that was, that was me. I, I felt best. I mean, my family felt best. The doctors felt best, but I felt like it was also kind of my decision because I said either way, but I was just like, no, let's just do it. So I feel like I have been active and I, I like, again, I'm very self-aware of myself and knowing something's wrong. So when a medication didn't work out for me, I was like, something has got to give. I can't do this for five plus years doing this to myself. So I, I feel like I was active in at least the hormonal treatment and the surgery as well. That's awesome. So Mesa, what about you? So you, you know, you did the right things in so many ways. They're throwing all these terms at you and you have to ramp up really, really fast. So how does one ramp up to all this information to make these important life altering choices in a matter of weeks? How did you do that? Research, research, research. I cannot stress research enough. Your doctor doesn't have all day to sit with you. I know mine personally did not, but if there was something I didn't understand, I had him write it down. I had my medical chart on my phone. If I didn't get it, I figured it out because I didn't want to go into it not understanding what was happening and what my options were. From start to finish, I knew everything. I knew exactly what I wanted. I got an option from beginning to end. If there was something that was uncomfortable or if I was in pain or if it was too much and I have a low pain tolerance, they took their time every single time. But I cannot stress the importance of research. You are your own advocate. If you don't understand what's going on with you, how can you expect someone else to understand what's going on with you? And so when I'm reading everything about myself, after they've taken blood, if they've done CC or, or whatever they choose to do, I am constantly looking it up. I'm constantly asking questions. I'm constantly sending them emails to get a better understanding of what it's like today and what it'll be like in the end and what's the in-between supposed to look like because the in-between is that that most important part so i can get to you know a better place in the end so research a hundred percent yeah i always say that what you're saying is you have to ask 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 until you're comfortable and no just keep digging until you have the right answers people are oftentimes afraid of talking about cancer or afraid of people who are living with advanced stage breast cancer and they want to just kind of sometimes gloss over things till it's already almost too late. So how can we, you know, educate our, our viewers on how to better be supportive, be aware, and to your points earlier, change our healthcare providers or help to empower them or educate them to better serve us as women who are healthy and or in treatment and even beyond. Because when you're done, they're like, ring the bell, go home. And then you're like, well, what's next? We'll start with Mesa. I would absolutely say to be proactive instead of reactive. We tend to wait till the bad things happen and they're at the forefront of our health instead of just potentially maybe just taking one more blood test or maybe just looking at something at a different angle because we could have easily prevented 
the health issue that, you know, was probably underlining that was probably always there by just being proactive instead of reactive. How do you reduce, reduce your risk? I mean, of course, knowing your family health history, pursuing the testing and so forth and being your advocates, one way to do that. But what are things people can do in their lives every day in terms of lifestyle, as well as the testing and, and having prophylactic surgery? What do you do to ensure that you lower your risk of breast cancer? Exercise, even if it's just walking, power walking, getting out, getting some fresh air, getting you know a little bit of vitamin D, a little bit of sun, eating healthier, making healthier choices. Of course, we won't always make a healthy choice, but you know, if you switch the burger out for a salad, who knows what that could do for your cholesterol. Obviously, it's a little bit more healthy. Reducing your stress, for me, I soak up stress. I don't know what it is, but every time it happens, I, I get sick. Um, so, I, of course, my biggest thing to reduce your stress as much as humanly possible, however that is, if that's just spending a night at home by yourself watching a movie, if that's hanging out with friends, reading a book, self-care, I know has been more of a trending word, but it is absolutely imperative for your health, uh, for your mental health, for your physical health. You will never find that outside of taking care of yourself first. So absolutely doing everything you can to make sure that your yourself, that stress, that exercise, what you're fueling your body with, getting enough rest or trying to make up for a little bit of rest here and there, putting yourself first. Those things are, I've, I've found to be very imperative in my overall health journey for, for sure. Yeah. So how can our healthcare system better support patients because you know many women your age go to see a doctor they're told that they don't need to get mammograms till they hit 45 or whatever or to not take a test but you know the issue is systemic it's not just it's not our fault that we're told these things because if you were told that by a doctor you tend to say okay you're a doctor i'm just me i'm gonna go home right and women sometimes often aren't as proactive as both of you are so how can we change our healthcare system so we have physicians who are accountable to us in a way that we don't make these kind of mistakes. I would say educate themselves <laughs> in a way that it doesn't just happen to anybody over the age of 40, not even just with breast cancer, but in cancer in general, like it is affecting people who are younger than that. And, and also getting the resources and, and maybe even trainings to know how to talk to younger adults because Luckily, I did have a good support system and luckily I did have great doctors, but at the same time, if I didn't, they, of course, maybe like the situations that you guys had where they turn you down. We're educating ourselves knowing what to do in a situation, in a traumatic situation where most people don't go through this, but at the same time, maybe educating themselves as well, knowing that cancer can happen at any age. Maybe even screening start earlier because it's not just happening to people over a certain age. It can happen to anybody. And especially with me, I took the DNA test. There, nobody in my family has cancer, nobody. I, I'm like maybe one of my family members and it was lung cancer. Now, I don't have the gene, I don't have anything. And the only thing that they could say it was, was environmental. And so in that case, your lifestyle has to completely change as well. And as Mays was saying, exercising, sleeping, taking care of yourself because you only have your body you only have yourself and especially luckily me i was giving the life again i was i survived it and so for me to keep going i need to do what's best for myself and my mental health because that's just important to take care of yourself when you go through something like that for, for me i i had reconstruction surgery and i for a while, for like three months though, like I couldn't do anything. And so at that time, I actually had my reconstruction surgery before my chemo. So at that point I was like, okay, I can do this. And then I had chemo. And so then when you're bald and then you have scars, you're like, what? I, I didn't feel like a woman. And I like wear a wig. And so like people would be like, oh, I love that you got like a new haircut or a new style. I'm like, don't have any idea right now. And so, I actually, a year after I decided to shave my head, I actually got started dating again. And I was so, so, so self-conscious. Like I had my curly hair, I'm, I'm dating my, my best friend for two and a half years and he accepted me for who I am. But at that time, before I met him, 
I didn't know how to go out in the world. I'm like, at this point, I'm 22. Like, I should be like young and free and happy and, you know, going on dates and having fun. And instead it was like, I'm so embarrassed of like somebody, you know, realizing like I have scars or, you know, I just got out of chemo. Like I didn't get this haircut. Like this was from, you know, having cancer. And so that played a big toll on my confidence. And, you know, seeing how all of these girls, especially in college, when all of these girls you're going out and, and people are hanging out and, you know, they're meeting people and guys and, and just all of this. And then there's you and you're like, all right, well, where do I go from here? And so I think also building that confidence, I can say that I've had every hairstyle now and I rocked every hairstyle. So you get stronger from it. And and so now, you know, I have my hair back and, and it's healthier and, and I'm healthier. And so it it takes time, it's a process, but at the end of it, at least for me, I got through it and, and able to get to those deep, dark places and know that I overcame that. So your best friend is your boyfriend now? Yes. <laughs> so what's your boyfriend's name? Can you share? His name is Max. All right, we, we now live together too and we have two dogs. <laughs> we gotta catch up after the show then. This is amazing. Yeah. I'm so happy for you. That's awesome. So now you have a person that you found who became your friend, your best friend, and who's your boyfriend now who accepts all of you, which is so important. That's amazing. So with you, Meja, you know, going through the prophylactic mastectomy, what was it like, you know, getting peer support to understand why you made these choices, you know, how it changed your self image and how'd you have those tough conversations with your friends? Like, I'm going to do this thing. It's going to change my body. How did you get support during that time from your friends? I have some of the most incredible friends I ever asked for. All of them came and visited me. Some of them watched my dog for me. They brought me flowers. I never had to explain myself to them. It's, this is what's going on. This is what I have to do. And they're like, okay, well, what can I do to help? It's always, what can I, like, what can I do to help? Do you need anything? And I decided to actually make a YouTube page so that way when people weren't with me or like friends and family that didn't live in town or whatever, they could just keep up and understand what it was like to go through what I went through. Cause it's one thing to tell someone like, Oh, you know, that sucks. It's another thing for them to physically see me in agony the way I, I was in because you have those drains coming out of you. For me, I was all taped up. I had a back. I, I don't, I don't know how I got blessed with such incredible friends but they, they, I've never had to explain myself a, a, a day in my life. They were supportive from the first conversation. That's powerful. For those, again, who are watching, if you are hearing this conversation, it's so powerful. Two women who are young making these life-altering decisions about their breasts and their bodies and, yeah, and their lives, you know? If you're a friend of somebody who's going through breast cancer, you know, just show up for them, be there for them, ask what you can do ask how to lend a hand, or if you don't know what to ask or say or do, just sit there and be with them. There's so much out there that's, that we know about breast cancer nowadays, but when I was diagnosed, we didn't have a lot of awareness about people who were younger. And so my friends were there for me, but they didn't know what to do, but they just sat there anyway. <laughs> they would just show up and they would sit with me and we would talk about anything. And so just even just the presence for somebody and saying, I love you, I don't know what to do, but I do know that I care about you and I love you and I'm gonna hold your hand is so, so, so important. My family was amazing. They come over and give my daughter baths, they bathe Noelle, comb her hair, take her out for to run errands. They cooked, they cleaned. And just having that presence in your, in your life is so, so critical. How do you explain to a friend who's in college or 21, 22, what trains are? How do you talk about those kind of things with people? For whatever reason, uh, my friends like to describe me as a very honest person, very upfront kind of person. So I would just tell them, you know, how it is. I'm like, it's it's a tube. It literally goes all the way through the middle to the middle of my chest. It's collecting, you know, that extra fluid. So that way I don't get it. I think it's called a hematoma. So that builds up a fluid that causes, you know, a bruise or, you know, can really impact your surgery. So some of them came over and so they got to see what they looked like. I told them about the vac. The vac is, you know, to keep the wound suction closed. So that way it's a little bit more of a seamless uh, healing process. You're so used to when you hear of like breast implants or augmentations or anything like that, you're so used to the, you know, the normal, they just pop an implant in and you're just kind of down and out for a week and those girls are out in, you know, Miami doing their thing. And it's a totally different situation when you're getting your breast tissue removed 
Um, Cause you have to remind them like, if I am to have a child, I can, I can never breastfeed. I don't have the tissue to do that. Or you have to tell them like, oh, like I kept my nipples. Some people don't do that. You know, it's up to you. You know, there's all these different avenues that you can take. And then there's avenues that are now closed, like obviously breastfeeding or, you know, if you chose to keep your nipples or if you chose not to keep your nipples, you know, there's doors that are, you know, now closed. And I just, for myself, I just, I just told them, told them like it was. I told them that I kept them. <laughs> I told them what I can do, what I can do, what I, you know, chose to get when it came to getting my reconstruction, how I wanted them, you know, to look so that way I could feel more confident, you know, moving forward, considering now you're, you're riddled with scars. Um, you're constantly reminded when you take your clothes off that you aren't who you were prior to now. I just told them like it was. <laughs> So Brittany, how would you talk to a woman who's 21 years old or, you know, around thereabouts, who's healthy, living her life and not even thinking about breast cancer? What would you advise your younger self? For me, I feel like it's very cliche to say, but having a positive attitude throughout this entire process has helped me. There were times where I was like, why is this happening to me? But the more that I, I said that, the more I would go into this rabbit hole. And like you saw me, I wasn't at the greatest place, but then my mindset changed. And throughout that, I was like, you can do this. You can conquer this. You're going to get through this because you're going to. But I just told myself that I'm going to. And I feel like if I had the opposite mindset, which I know that I did at the beginning, I would just keep going and I wouldn't be proud of the person that I am now knowing looking back that I was negative towards all of this because out of my cancer journey I am the person I am today I am strong I'm proud and also the support system that I have we're even closer than that we were you build a bond with people and you also build a bond within yourself to know that anything that life throws at you, you're able to get through it. And I just feel like the positive mindset is key to this. As hard as it can be, and as easy as people say, you're gonna get through it, you're gonna do it, you actually have to believe it yourself. Because at the end of the day, all you do is you have yourself and you have to advocate, like I said before, we've talked about this, is just advocating for yourself, sticking up for yourself, doing what you need to do for you at the end of the day. And I just think that being positive and, you know, having quote unquote good vibes around you is what is going to help you in the long run, especially going through something traumatic. You're so right, Amaza. What would you tell a girl your age, you know, if her parent had a history of breast cancer, going from that to even the testing, what would you advise someone your age to do? I would tell her to push the envelope. My doctor actually told me a story once that he had a patient when she had her drains in, she was like, you, do you ever numb anyone before they get the drains out? He's like, no, that it shouldn't hurt that bad. And she was like, well, let's just try it. He numbed her and she had no pain and it was an easy removal. And from there on out, he numbed everybody when they got their drains removed just to make it more comfortable, you know? So you never know who you can impact, including a doctor, yep. if you just go ahead and push the envelope. In one word, how do you live your life differently, Mesa? Perseverance is probably the word I would use. I, I just don't give up. It's not, it's not in me to give up. It's not in your DNA. I love it. Brittany, in one word, how do you live life differently? I would say blossom. I have blossomed and I'm still doing that. Like I said, I, I even have a tattoo of a tiger lily on the back of me that says strength. To, to always remind myself that I'm strong enough and I'm capable enough to, to get through anything that life throws at me. And I, I would hope for the same for everybody. If you're even going through a traumatic experience to know that you can get through this, it, it can be tough, but you have to keep going. And in my case, blossom and, and have, have that strength. You have blossom like a tiger lily, like a flower. <laughs> Thank you both for being here with us. You both are so inspiring. Mesa, you inspire me as a woman and a woman of color, you know? You're helping other women of color know what to ask for, how to be their, better, their best advocates, and how to ensure they have life-saving testing. So thank you for being the advocate and a voice. And Brittany, you're so amazing as well, and I'm so proud of you, both of you guys. Keep persevering and keep blossoming. Love you both. Thank you. Thank so you. Much for having me. <laughs>
So there you have it, guys. Um, aren't they amazing and inspiring? They're so beautiful. And so in watching the episode today, I hope you learned more about women who are younger are getting breast cancer, how to be educated about your body, um, trust your body, how to know when to act, and when to hire or fire your doctor. And the two words he left with us are so powerful. Learn how to persevere and that you can blossom during and after your breast cancer journey. Until next time, be well and bye for now. Thank you.